I have the feeling that the American audience is not so stupid that they like constantly to be played down to mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, you know, fed the same old junk uh, time after time, which is going further and further and further in what direction, nobody knows. But it is not necessarily the product of the brilliant writers in this country and other countries who are available and also of actors. Now, you can hire any actor for a brilliant part for a little amount of money. But your agent... Where anyone, thinks. I don't know, the agents yeah. even have finally come to that. And I do think that it is terribly important in our country to try to improve the, our product. Yeah. Improve our product so that an audience uh, uh, can go and, and, and say, well, yes, I've seen his plays, I've seen her plays, I've seen this one's plays, and I've seen so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so in them. Mm -hmm. They're movie productions, they're brilliant directors, they're brilliant properties, they're wonderful parts, and they're thrilling. When I first heard they about They do it. make sense. Maybe that's a disadvantage today, I don't know. <laughs> like many other well-remembered actors from classic Hollywood, Catherine Hepburn has her fair share of truly well-known classics, like The Philadelphia Story, Bringing Up Baby, The African Queen or The Lion in Winter, but also movies that barely ring a bell anymore today for a different variety of reasons. I mean, I doubt anybody would put Dragon Seed or The Iron Petticoat as their number one Catherine Hepburn movie. And then of course, there's everything in between, from smaller classics like Summertime or Alice Adams, to all her Spencer Tracy collaborations like Woman of the Year and Adam's Rip, and movies that are, quite frankly, mostly remembered because they brought her an Oscar nomination for Best Actress. Otherwise, pictures like Morning Glory or The Rainmaker would most likely land on the forgotten list. And what about Long Day's Journey into Night? This one seems to defy any of the mentioned categories. It is another picture that only got one Oscar nomination for Best Actress, but it is also based on one of the most celebrated plays of the 20th century, remembered by director Sidney Lumet as his personal favorite and often cited as one of Hollywood's best Broadway adaptations. So you can say it's a small, more private classic of Catherine Hepburn. One that maybe not all her fans have heard of, but still a movie with a distinct following, offering Catherine Hepburn one of the most challenging roles in theater history that would later bring Tony Awards to both Vanessa Redgrave and Jessica Lange. And it's also a part that came to Catherine Hepburn at a time of great personal pain, and her private life would influence her work on the screen to a degree that it never had before. So let's talk about how the paths of Hollywood giant and theater giant met in 1962. When Eugene O'Neill started working on Long Day's Journey into Night, he had already received various Pulitzer Prizes and the Nobel Prize for Literature for his dark and complex plays, presenting families on the brink of sanity and characters fallen from grace in a usual tragic and almost hopeless tone. But even within this woeful body of work, Long Day's Journey into Night was painfully different. A play that did not focus on the tragedies of just any family, but Eugene O'Neill's very own. His father James, a talented actor who suffered all his life from what he considered wasting his talents in popular plays, such as The Count of Monte Cristo, which he did more than 6,000 times, to financially support his family. His elder brother James Jr., who drank himself to death, always blamed for indirectly causing the death of the O'Neill's second son, when he infected him with measles at the age of 18 months. Then Eugene O'Neill himself, the poet born to replace the brother who died. And his mother, addicted to morphine for more than two decades, after she had been given the drug to relieve her from the pains of giving birth. In 1939, O'Neill would begin to write down the haunting memories of his father, mother and brother, who all died within four years between 1920 and 1923, in a play that broke down the difficult relationships over a single day and night, and the O'Neills became the Tyrones, a family held together and drawn apart. Mother vs. Father, Brother vs. Brother, Sons vs. Parents. After completing his play in 1941, O'Neill said about these characters, at the final curtain, there they still are, trapped within each other by the past, each guilty and at the same time innocent, scorning, loving, pitying each other, understanding and yet not understanding at all, forgiving, but still doomed never to be able to forget. Due to its personal nature, 
O'Neill would only permit his closest friends to read the play or even know about its existence. Otherwise, he stated in his testament that it should only be published 25 years after his death and never be produced as a play. However, after he died in 1953, his widow Carlotta Monterey would, for reasons still unknown today, oppose his final wish and publish it in 1955. As you can imagine, the surprise of a posthumous play by one of America's greatest playwrights electrified artistic communities around the world. Especially because Long Day's Journey Into Night was not just any play, but almost immediately hailed as one of the greatest pieces of American literature. While the work of Tennessee Williams was more and more criticized and even ridiculed towards his later years, O'Neill was praised for having astonished the world from beyond the grave with the best play of his career. And critics would call O'Neill the world's last dramatist of the stature of William Shakespeare. The play version premiered in Sweden in 1956 in front of an audience that included the Swedish king and queen and the evening was called the greatest theatrical event of the 20th century. And when Long Day's Journey Into Night premiered on Broadway later that year, reactions were the same and O'Neill would posthumously win his fourth Pulitzer Prize and a Tony Award. As I have mentioned in other videos, the bond between Hollywood and Broadway was extremely strong during the 50s and 60s. I mean, we have Sweet Bird of Youth and The Miracle Worker in this category in the same year as well. So a movie version of Long Day's Journey Into Night was basically expected. But despite the acclaim for the play, this would not be the kind of prestigious, expensive adaptation that for example the work by Tennessee Williams received regularly. In his case, the daring, provocative nature of his plots were almost always a guarantee for big box office. The downbeat and hopeless tone of Eugene O'Neill's world, on the other hand, far less provocative and much more internally driven, never received the same kind of attention from movie studios. Sure, there are the occasional prestige adaptations, like Morning Becomes Electra, but they were clearly not made on a big budget and mostly destined to win awards, certainly unable to compete with the dominance that the work by Tennessee Williams enjoyed over Hollywood during the 50s and 60s. And Long Day's Journey Into Night, a three-hour, bleak tragedy of guilt and blame, was again not seen as the kind of material that would attract a large audience and was therefore made on a much smaller budget. Produced by Eli Landau, who had already worked on the TV series The Play of the Week, which would bring productions like Medea or Mary Stewart right into America's living rooms. To bring Long Day's Journey Into Night to the big screen, Lenda would secure Ralph Richardson, Dean Stockwell and Jason Roberts, who was the only actor reprising his work from the Broadway stage, and Oscar nominee Sidney Lumet, who was already familiar with both Eli Lando and Eugene O'Neill, as he had directed The Iceman Commerce for the play of the week. And for the female lead, Lando felt right from the beginning that one of the great female roles in American theater could only be played by one of the screen's greatest actresses. Now you might wonder, why not give the role to an actress truly connected to the stage and the play, maybe even Florence Eldridge, who had originated Mary Tyrone on Broadway. After all, Anne Bancroft and Geraldine Page both recreated the stage successes the same year. Well, for one thing, there is the cold hard fact that, even with a small budget, Long Day's Journey Into Night was supposed to make some money, and neither the already cast Richardson, nor Roberts, nor Stockwell were guarantees for box office success. So it was clear that it had to be Mary Tyrone who had to bring in an audience, making this one of the few instances during this time when it was the female lead who was supposed to make the movie a hit. This criterion already made it clear that the character had to be a movie actress of a certain standing and reputation. But the final decision to offer the role to Catherine Hepburn did thankfully go beyond her idea as an investment and was made from a purely artistic point of view. Because first of all, she was clearly interested in roles that originated on the stage and often gave an actress more opportunities and challenges. In fact, four of her last five movies, Summertime, The Rainmaker, Desk Set and Suddenly Last Summer, were all based on Broadway and off-Broadway plays. And beyond that, Catherine Hepburn was not only interested in adaptations of stage material, but in the stage itself as well, gaining her a strong reputation as one of the few actresses of her age and longevity still willing to challenge herself and develop as a performer even after more than 20 years in the business. After her appearance in Desk Set in 1957, 
Catherine Hepburn even took a risk that many established performers like her most likely would not have dared to. Doing Shakespeare, appearing in The Merchant of Venice, as Viola in Twelfth's Night, as Beatrice in Much Ado About Nothing and in Antony and Cleopatra at the Shakespeare Festival in Stratford, Connecticut. Reviews for her performances were definitely mixed, some downright negative, but she still earned a lot of admiration for her willingness to tackle this material and prove herself as an actress when most thought she had already proven more than enough. Doing those classical roles was not what most people expected of me. The reviews were sometimes mixed, sometimes raves, but it gave me real satisfaction, sort of a seal of approval. As an actress, you might say, yes, I needed that. Most actors do, I think, what the hell, don't we all? For producer Eli Landau and director Sidney Lumet, Catherine Hepburn was therefore the ideal choice for the role of Mary Tyrone right from the beginning. Lumet would describe the casting of such a living legend as perfect, because when Mary Tyrone falls, it's got to be like a giant oak falling. When Landau reached out to Catherine Hepburn with the offer, she was, as expected, highly interested in what she considered one of the greatest female roles ever written especially after Lando assured her that the movie would stick very closely to the source material. Which was actually a necessity, because Carlotta Monterey demanded that all productions of her deceased husband's play would have to stick very closely to his original writing, meaning that Lando was not allowed to make any big changes for the screen version. For Kate, it was therefore clear that Lando's long day's journey into night would bring her as close to the original Broadway production as possible giving her the character of Mary with all her flaws, terrors, but also endless opportunities, which was the main thing she wanted for the project. Landau had at first been worried that a small budget might cause Kate to reject the role, she would receive $25,000 for the movie compared to $175 for her last picture suddenly last summer, but she was in a comfortable position that she could choose projects only based on her interest and not any financial pressure, saying, the only time I've ever really kicked myself is when I've done something I didn't want to do, just because of the money involved. Well, we worked very long hours, a very long play, very hard play for her, and indeed for me I played the husband, very long parts. And the studio we played in, in New York was a very small studio, a very tiny little studio. And well, there weren't any, really any proper dressing rooms, so we had little tents made on the side of the set, and there we used to... Huh, Susan Gasp. And you did one at a price that your agent must have fainted dead no, away. No, no, no. Well, I've, uh, that's not unusual for me. I've done... I've, uh, uh, if it interests you, they don't need to pay you. It's a fascinating business anyway. It's very nice to be paid. But when you do uh, thrilling material, it's like buying a piece of furniture that's really good. When you buy it and it's great, you get enormous pleasure out of seeing it and you never remember how much it costs. So this was definitely the kind of project that had the power to bring Catherine Hepburn back to the screen after three year absence. But the actress still hesitated about accepting the part of Mary. Not because of any artistic differences or self-doubt that she might not be up to play such a challenging part, but because of very painful problems in her personal life. As she remembered, the two men in my life I loved were dying. By 1962, the health of Catherine Hepburn's longtime partner Spencer Tracy had gotten worse and worse. He developed ulcers and skin cancer, was chronically exhausted, but would also continue to drink heavily, causing his kidneys to slowly fail as well. For Catherine Hepburn, retiring from the screen after suddenly last summer was therefore a step not only influenced by her interest in stage work or the fact that the shooting of the movie which famously ended with her spitting into either the face of director Joseph Mankiewicz or producer Sam Spiegel, or even both of them, made her lose interest in more movie projects for the time, but also by her decision to focus her energy on supporting Spencer Tracy, using her own influence to get him work and taking care of him during the shootings. Spence felt guilty about my having taken time away from my career to be with him. I think he overestimated the status of my career at the moment. I don't think I would have been buried under a landslide of fabulous parts. Our mailman wasn't bent under the weight of great scripts arriving for me. I didn't care. I was where I wanted to be, doing what I wanted to do. Is this the only man you were really in love with? I would say so. 
Here you are and were one of the most independent women, and yet you write that if Spencer Tracy disliked something about you, some quality, some yes. aspect of your appearance, you would change. Yes. What happened to the independence? You who represent independence. If he didn't like it, you change? Yeah. He, he said, I don't like this outfit. Please put on a skirt and high heels. Yes, I would have. But it wasn't that silly. What were the qualities that he didn't like that he wanted you to change? Do you remember? Oh, the obvious ones, you know, that I'm rather loud. I speak up instead of down. And th some of the things that I like to do, he didn't like to do. One of the projects Catherine Hepburn rejected during this period was to appear in the role of Hannah in Tennessee Williams' The Night of the Iguana on Broadway. Williams had written the part specifically for Catherine, but she continued to put most of her energy on caring for Spencer Tracy, appearing on the stage occasionally, but unwilling to commit herself to a possibly year-long Broadway run. Kate also convinced Spencer Tracy to do Judgment at Nuremberg in 1961 and accompanied him to Germany for on-location shooting, but after he completed the movie, his health would take another dramatic turn for the worse, and apart from narrating how the West was won, he would only appear in two more movies before he died in 1967. Catherine Hepburn was therefore faced with the question if she should do Long Day's Journey into Night on the East Coast while Spencer Tracy was living in California. She initially wanted Spencer to play opposite her in the movie, but he rejected the idea due to the small salary. Kate herself, however, believed that he was scared of the part and did not feel that he was up to it due to his poor health. But Spencer Tracy was actually just one of the men in Catherine Hepburn's life who was dying. The other was her father. She remembered about him. They discovered that he had a burst gallbladder. It had been full of stones and of course his abdomen was full of stones and of bile too. He was gradually being poisoned. The pain must have been really excruciating. Considering that her father was living in Connecticut, it became clear to Catherine Hepburn that she would have to split up her time between East and West anyway, no matter if she would do Long Day's Journey into Night or not, and finally committed to the project. Working on the movie was an overall very smooth experience. The entire cast would rehearse the play for three weeks prior to shooting to memorize the different monologues and perform long scenes at a time. Kate would remember her work on the movie as O'Neill's knowledge of people and his analysis was really swilling. I just had to think and to concentrate and to read the lines. This play is about shattered, destroyed people, like all of us in some ways. About a woman who lives in an atmosphere which stifles and destroys her. In turn, she interacts in an emotional breakdown to those closest to her. I felt entirely supported by the words. What an experience. I'll never forget it. I think Lumet brought out something different in me. I guess it's called simplicity. I said to myself, don't act, don't do anything. Let the audience hear the lines. The part is so brilliantly written, it just carried me along. The overwhelming loneliness of that lost, drug-addicted woman. We rehearsed for three weeks, then we just shot it in sequence from beginning to end, like a play. Long Day's Journey Into Night was also the first movie that Kate worked on where she didn't watch the daily rushes at the end of the day, explaining that she only wanted to focus on her work and not pay any attention to her aging face. I need all my strength and concentration to just play the part. Director Sidney Lumet became a great admirer of Catherine Hepburn during the shooting, applauding both her strong on-screen personality but also the delicacy of her performance calling her magnificent and explaining the work with her was swelling. She built that character stone by stone. But of course, working on Long Day's Journey into Night was also extremely difficult for Catherine Hepburn as she balanced her work with the care for both her father and Spencer Tracy. I would leave Friday after we finished filming in New York and drive to my father in Connecticut. My father was dying a prolonged and horrible death over many months and there was no hope of his getting better, only the knowledge that he would be worse. At the same time, Spencer wasn't well at all. 
I was told his health was deteriorating rapidly. So Saturday, after I had been with my father, I frequently flew to spend some time with Spencer and I left Sunday to be back on set. Few people know what they mean when they say, I love you. What did those words mean to you? Well, the, the word, what does the word love mean? It means total interest. I think if the, the, the reason very few people really fall in love with anyone is that they're not willing to pay the price. What's the price? The price is that uh, you adjust, you adjust yourself to, to them. them. Now, if you love back, that's great. Then there's no problem. And if you're not love back, then it can be a problem. Catherine Hepburn's father would die in 1962, and she later admitted how her personal life had a strong effect on her performance. Long Day's journey into night was the mirror image of my own agony during that time. Sometimes I cried so profusely that after the director said cut, I needed a few minutes to stop crying. The worse your private life, yeah. the pleasanter uh, it is to go into a land, the Never Never Land. To get away from and it. And then if you're very, very happy, yeah. the Never Never Land is. So most actors, I think, fundamentally yeah. can use the miseries. I think that's why I'm so happy. The, the, you Some the, people can't use the miseries, you know. Yeah, I think an, any kind of an artist, generally, can use the sorrows and the miseries for creative effect. Wonder, Terrible thing to say, because it's not very, you know, flattering to their characters, but it is true. You cry very often in films. Do you ever cry in real life? Cry? Cry. No, don't cry. Only in films? I don't cry. In films you do? Yeah. So they'll know I'm sad. When Long Day's Journey was released, it became clear that Catherine Hepburn had more than succeeded in using her own pain and misery to create a tortured and haunted soul on the screen. Critics called her portrayal fascinating and a piece of art, and she was praised for being the best member of the cast and shifting the focus of the play from the character of the father to the role of Mary, and quite simply for having given the greatest performance in a career full of great performances. However, there was also some criticism for her work, mostly connected to the fact that many reviewers considered Catherine Hepburn too strong and forceful for such a role, too alert a spirit for a woman sliding into madness or simply calling her, quote, too Hollywood, eventually comparing her negatively to Broadway actress Florence Eldridge. As expected, despite the star power of Catherine Hepburn, the movie was also not a financial success. The studio behind Long Day's Journey Into Night would ultimately cut 40 minutes, but it was still an almost three hour, depressive display of a family experiencing a nervous breakdown. So not the kind of movie likely to attract viewers looking for some distraction on a Saturday evening. Besides, Long Day's Journey Into Night was also a victim of bad timing. It was initially selected as the US entry for the 1962 Cannes Film Festival together with John Frankenheimer's All Fall Down, and would win acting awards for the entire cast, but it was not released in the US until the end of 1962 in a specifically built theater in New York City. Buzz from Cannes had certainly died down by then, but far worse, the premiere would overlap with one of the biggest newspaper strikes in New York history. The movie therefore received little critical attention during its release, making movie theaters even more hesitant about it. I mean, showing a three-hour tragedy is one thing, but showing a three-hour tragedy with hardly any critical support in the press? Most of the reviews, including the ones about Catherine Hepburn I just mentioned, were therefore slowly released during 1963, after the Oscars had already taken place, when Long Day's Journey Into Night was opening in more and more theaters across the country. The lack of critical support was also seen as the main reason why only Catherine Hepburn, who certainly benefited from name recognition and excitement about her comeback to the screen after three years in one of the theater's greatest female parts, was nominated for an Oscar and none of her equally praised co-stars. Okay, so let's talk about Catherine's nominated performance now. And well, to begin right away, reviewing this performance is rather an almost epic occasion. Because, to put it simply, 
Long Day's Journey Into Night features not only the greatest performance ever given by Catherine Hepburn, but one of the greatest performances ever given, period. If I can only find... What is it I'm looking for? I know it's something I lost. Mary, no good, Papa. Something I... I miss. Terribly. It feels almost impossible to describe the miracle of Catherine Hepburn's achievements as Mary Tyrone. She has never been so vulnerable and yet so strong, so invisible but so present, so reluctant and yet so determined, so miscast and yet so completely ideal. It makes it so much harder living in this atmosphere of constant suspicion, knowing everyone is spying on me, that none of you believe in me or trust me. That's crazy, Mama. We do trust you. Some place I could go to get away for a day or even an afternoon. Some woman friend I could talk to. Not about anything serious, simply laugh and gossip and forget for a while. Miscast might sound like a strong word to use, when talking about one of the screen's great performances, but I don't think that critics at the time were completely wrong when they said that the power of Catherine Hepburn is too strong for a woman who has an almost ghost-like presence. Because yes, this strength is visible at every moment, even when Mary is at her lowest, but Catherine Hepburn was somehow able to take this strength and use it for the exact opposite effect, emphasizing the weaknesses of Mary at every moment. And by totally surrendering to the character's demons and horrors, Catherine Hepburn is almost exhausting in her intensity, never giving the audience a single moment of peace, driving Mary further and further away into the darkness of her own mind, without ever giving any reason for hope. You don't understand. I've been so worried, so worried about Edmund. I'm so afraid. I don't want to listen to your excuses, Mary. Excuses? Oh, you, you mean... Oh. You couldn't believe that of me. You mustn't believe that, James. No. The magnetic presence of Catherine Hepburn maybe outshines everything and everyone around her, but she is still part of an ensemble, never actively dominating the proceedings and not only wallowing in the misery of her character, going from one big scene to the next, but instead creating a true character, past, present and future. A mother and wife constantly hiding her true intentions and her true feelings about everyone else while exposing her inner thoughts at every moment for everyone to see. I couldn't possibly eat anything, James. I think you'll have to excuse me. My, my hands pain me dreadfully. I think the best thing for me is to go to bed and rest. There is a stern contrast in the work of Catherine Hepburn, survivor from Hollywood's Golden Age, to the work by British theatre actor Ralph Richardson and the more modern approaches by Jason Roberts and Dean Stockwell. All of them excellent by the way and very deserving of Oscar nominations. And the effect can probably best be described as Marlon Brando and Vivian Lee in A Streetcar Named Desire. The roles, characteristics, intentions and results are certainly very different, but something about Catherine Hepburn's acting style puts her at a natural distance to her co-stars as she constantly attacks and retreats from their work. A struggle without a clear winner, but always dominated by both Mary Tyrone and Catherine Hepburn, and always in service of the overall plot and structure. And that it was exactly the same type of cheap quack who first gave you the medicine and you never knew what it was until it was too late. I hate doctors! For God's sake, Mama, stop talking. Yes, Mary, it's no time to... You're... you're... quite right, dear. Forgive me, I'm... I, uh, it's useless to be angry now. Catherine Hepburn had already shown in Suddenly Last Summer how she could play with dialogue, switching directions in her speech from one moment to the next, adding layer after layer of meaning to her spoken words with a slight change of emphasis or speed, and she would do the same again and even more impressively in Long Day's Journey into Night. So much of Mary, the family, the past, her suffering, her fears, her few moments of happiness, and most of all her regrets, are expressed in long speeches, in denials of accusations, in occasions when Mary feels trapped or suddenly secure, and Catherine Hepburn constantly supports these moments with a devastating vagueness and clarity, emphasizing how the absence of Mary's mind only strengthens her physical directness. And you want yes. me to pay attention to what Dr. Hardy says, oh no! Listen, Mama! 
I'm going to tell you whether you want to hear it or not. I've got to go away to a sanatorium. How dare your father allow it? You're my baby. There is obviously much more to say about Long Day's journey into night, its deeper meanings, its complexities, and of course the characters presented, than I have room to do here, and even a lot more about Catherine Hepburn's performance. But at the same time, it feels impossible to capture every aspect of her work, the brilliance of her voice, the shattering pain in her eyes, the complete surrender to the torments of Mary Tyrone. She was rarely so raw, so delicate and yet so forceful on the screen. Taking a role that could have felt like a trap and opened it up by presence, talent, dedication and a willingness to take risks and go to places we had never seen her go before. And few performances in this category have ever reached this level of artistry before or since. If only I could find the faith I lost so I could pray to her again. Hail Mary, full of grace. Scanning through newspaper articles from the time of the making and the release of the movie, it becomes clear that Long Day's Journey into Night marked one of the rare occasions when Catherine Hepburn would not only agree with the critical raves about her work, but also made no secret about it, being much more available for interviews than usual to promote the movie and her work. My performance of Suffering was much more appreciated and some of those who had said I was more of a personality than a real actress suddenly acclaimed that performance, saying I was a real actress. My agony had won them over. Do you think that acting is a great art? No. What is it? I've... Uh, no, painting. Mm -hmm. well, I don't think acting is. I think some people's acting might be said to be, but not my acting. Death will be welcome, there are no more interviews. Yes. I'm not good at a public life. But why spend so many years at something that you, you say you're constitutionally unsuited for? Why not money? <laughs> what a terrible thing to say. It's not true. No, I found it fun. I find everything fun. When you open your door and you go out and they say, good morning, Miss Eppert, good morning. You're wonderful. We love you. Well. That's very reassuring, isn't it? After being rediscovered as a great performer of tragedies, Catherine Hepburn did not enter into a new phase of her career. Instead, she would again retreat to her private life, this time not just from movie acting, but from acting in general, appearing neither on the screen nor on the stage for the next five years to fully commit herself to take care of Spencer Tracy until his death just a few days after they completed Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Only then she would begin to act more regularly, not just returning to full form, but entering one of the most successful periods of her career, at an age when most other actresses would hardly find any work at all. But this is a story for another time. <laughs>